So you are allowed to use a note sheet on the final exam. Yes. However, it can only be one sheet of notes. So what is it, eight and a half inches by 11 inches, uh, which is just a regular standard sheet of paper. Uh, the printer paper might be a tiny bit bigger than a note sheet paper. Um, but you just get one sheet, one page only. But you can write front and back. Okay, so print on front and back is okay. Um, and then just write whatever you want. So you can have anything on there. I know with all the tasks that I've given you the formulas, right? And you were restricted to just using the formulas that I gave you. Um, however, here you could write whatever you want. So you could write all the formulas, you could write uh, examples, things like that. I try to tell folks to stay away from examples specifically because two things happen. One is that you're expecting the problem on the final exam to be exactly like the problem on your example. And chances are they're not the same functions. So they're not going to work exactly the same. But the formulas that you're applying will still kind of be in the same realm. Okay. Um, and then not only that, the second bad thing about examples is that when you have examples, people tend to start writing down the numbers of their example versus the numbers that are in the actual problem you're given on the test. And then you end up with the wrong answer because you're using a four instead of a five, right? Um, so those are the two. I'm not saying you can't have examples. If you need them, write them. But just be careful <laughs> with the examples you pick, okay? And be careful when you're trying to mimic whatever's in your example on the test, okay? Um, now, I don't remember all of my formulas, so I might have to go back and look some up, but hopefully not too much. So let's go ahead, try to think of what else. Oh, those that are in the remote, uh, in the remote class, the face-to-face -face class has to take the paper test. Um, and then the remote students, you guys will be taking the test, the final exam online. Um, you do have to take the final exam between 10 a.m. And I think I put it, I think I actually put an hour window on both sides. So anytime between 9 a.m. And it would end at 10 to 12, so 1 p.m. So you do have to take the final exam sometime in that period, okay? I cannot remember what day it's given that second. I think it was, I think it was that Monday. But let me do a double check. I don't know if it's on this timeline or if it's on the face-to-face. -face. Should be a both of those. Great, it's the same, it seems like ages ago, right? Oh yeah, on Monday the it. okay. So it's supposed to be from 10 to 12, but since the remote class, you're doing it remotely, uh, I'm giving you a little bit of a wider window in case, I don't know, for some reason, your computer's doing weird stuff or whatnot. Um, so I'm giving you just a little bit of window there to take it, but it is going to be Monday the 5th, okay? Um, this date should be the same for the face-to-face -face class. The online version of this class, I think because they're purely online, they have a different due date, but I'll have to confirm that due date and post it in, in their practice separately. Um, but these two things do still stick. And this note sheet must be shown in that environment check part of the video. So like when you start the setup for lockdown browser, you guys are remote. Um, Make sure when you're doing the environment check that you just show the page that you're going to use. If it has a backside, show the backside. Um, and then you should be good from there. I can screenshot if I need to do whatever I got to do. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start the problems. We do have today and the next class period. I don't think it's going to take us all of that time, but we'll just keep going and we'll finish where we end up. So for number one, it says to find this indefinite integral. So there's no bounds. We're just going to have the C right afterward. But in order to do it, we definitely have to rewrite this term as exponent over index. And once it's written in that exponent form, then we can go ahead and do the the power rule right on both of those. So this would be two thirds plus one 
which is going to be five thirds, and then divide by five thirds plus eight, and then it would now have an X plus C. And about the only thing to do that is instead of dividing by a fraction, you can multiply by the reciprocal of that fraction. So if you guys do this automatically, and that's okay. So it's taking us way back, right? These are not too bad. <laughs> they get crazier when we get in chapter eight, but in chapter five, they weren't awful. Now, this one, I'm definitely going to need to review a formula. Um, so it says evaluate the sum. Now, the basic concept, I could apply the basic concept. And what this means is you plug in one for I, then two for I, then three for I, then four, all the way up until you get to 40. And the sigma means you add all of those values together, right? But I highly doubt anyone's going to want to sit there and do that from one to four, excuse me, from one to 40, right? So we're going to use our formulas instead. And before I can use them, I definitely need to foil this out. And when I do foil it out, I will get I squared minus two I plus one. Right, because I'm doing I minus one times another I minus one. And then you have to actually foil it all out. Okay. And once I combine the negative I and the negative I, that's with the negative two I. Then from here, you can separate it into like three different sigmas factoring the negative two out, but it's not necessary. I don't remember, I think it's in n plus one to him, put something like that, but I don't want to <laughs> just guess and then be wrong. So let me go look for, it was way at the beginning. That's the summary of convergence. I think I'm just going to grab all these formula sheets and stick them up at the top. So we've got the calculus formulas, we've got those formulas. Like way back when we had another one. Oh, there is such a difference. Oh, thank you. Oh, I got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to put them all in here. So, for I squared, it's this fraction. Plus one, two, C, I'm just right. I should have just trusted. So, anyway, this one would become um, n, n plus one, two n plus one over six minus two times. And then the formula for I, that one's just n, n plus one over two. And then one is just the constant multiplier, so it gets multiplied by n. I'll minimize so you can see the formulas again, and then I'll come back. So see here, if you just have a constant, you just end up with that constant times n. That's where I squared, and then this was the formula for i. So I just applied all of those. Now you don't have to simplify this. You can literally just plug in in and then put the whole thing in a calculator, okay? Um, in this case, what is in? It is, right. So n equals 40, so that's top number, which means I'm gonna get 40, 40 plus one is just gonna be 41. Two times 40 is 80 plus one over six. Here you can cancel out the twos to make the computation a little bit easier in the calculator. But then you would have 40 times 41. And here you'd have one times 40, which is just 40. And then I'm not sure what that is in the calculator. Let me go see. Fraction. 
40 times 41 times P1 over 6 minus 40 times 41 plus 40. And I get 20540. So if you were to plug in 1, well, if you plug in 1, you're just going to get 0, right? But if you plug in 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 40 and then add all those numbers together, this is the value that you can get. Any questions so far? I know it's going way, way back, but. Mm -hmm. It helps to kind of just bring it, bring it back. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and do it for even though I do not like it. I honestly don't remember it being on the final, but I could be wrong. So I'll just cover it. Um, this one says to evaluate this indefinite integral, which I'm sure you can do using the integration rules, but it says by the limit definition. Okay. And the limit definition tells us that if you have this from A to B of whatever your function is, then you're essentially going to take the limit as n goes to infinity, i equal to one of f of c i, and then delta x i, and I will explain all that. Right, so you basically are going to split up your um, your image, your graph, right? Because this is basically finding the area underneath this function between x values one and three. Now you could graph it, but it's not necessary. Um, but essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut that area up into little pieces, right? And find the area of each of those rectangles or whatever they what, gets created when you cut it up into pieces. And you find the area of all those individual um, rectangles and then you add them up together and you get the actual total area. Remember that stuff? But they tell us when you increase the number of rectangles that you have, you get a more and more accurate area, right? And that's why we're taking in as n goes to infinity because that's gonna be the number of rectangles, okay? So if we want to find this delta x i, we have to do b minus a over n. Okay, that's going to basically be the width of all of our rectangles. Um, and then, so for this case, b would be 3 minus 1 over n, which is 2 over n. And then ci is going to be the new x value, okay? So it's a little bit weird, but ci is going to be a plus this thing times i. I'm trying to write it in a way so it doesn't look confusing. Because you're supposed to start at this lower bound, right? You don't start before that. So you shouldn't be using any x values before the one. You should be starting at the one, okay? And since your summation is gonna start uh, at one, it'll keep giving you each of those little rectangles. So in this case, it's gonna be my lower bound, which is one. My x i was two over n, and then I have to multiply that by i. So then what in the world would f of ci look like? That would look like f of one plus two i over n. And since this is my f, right, this guy here, it would be three times this thing squared. I won't do any of the algebra just yet. I'm gonna wait until I actually write this out. 
All I was doing was finding all the pieces, right? I need to know what delta xi is, and I do. And then I needed to know what f of ci is going to look like, and I know what that's going to look like now. So now I can write the setup and then go ahead and figure out the computation. So for my setup, it's going to be um, the limit as n goes to infinity i equal to one, and then f of c i. So this guy here times delta x i, which is the two over n. And from here is literally just the algebra part. Um, and then using those summation formulas, right? So let's go ahead and first square, right? You have to apply exponents before you can multiply. So let's go ahead and square that. You can multiply these two together. You just can't multiply it with this term because it has to get squared first. So I can write six over n in the front, right? That's like three over one. And then here, one times one is one. One times this is the same thing, but I have to do it twice. So I'm gonna end up with four i over n. And then that times itself is four i squared over n squared. Or you could take this off to the side, write it twice, right? And then foil it all out. Should end up with these three terms. Now I'm going to distribute this six over n in there. So I'm going to get six over n plus 24i over n squared plus 24i squared over n squared. And from here, I can apply my formulas. So this doesn't have any i's in it. So it's going to act like a constant. Okay, so you get six over n times n because the constants, right, just get multiplied by n. Here, you have 24 over n squared with an i. And the i has to use a formula. And you get n, n plus one over two. Here I can write 24 over n squared. And then the formula for i squared is the n, n plus one, two n plus one, all over six. Now here, you definitely have to simplify this because if you try to do the limit right now, you're gonna get a bunch of uh, indeterminate forms, right? You'll get infinity over infinity, infinity over infinity, and infinity over infinity. So we definitely have to simplify it. Just deciding to blow these right in front of my windows. <laughs> okay, well, those can strike out. So I just have six. Here, one of these ends can strike with one of those, and the two can reduce that to a 12. So I'll end up with 12 times n plus one, but still over one of those ends at the bottom. Because that end only counts over one of them, right? Now here, this end can again cancel one of these ends, and the six can reduce the 24 to four. So we end up with four, times n plus one, two n plus one, all over n. Now here's where you get like one common denominator and then you try to simplify everything, right? In order for me to make this guy have a common denominator, all I have to do is do n over n, right? So I will have six n plus, 12 n plus 12 is four. 
unless you can foil this. Everybody over here. Almost there. Those two together will make 18. And then this distributed out will be 8n squared. That's 3n. So it'll turn into 12n. That's 4. So we have 8n squared plus 30n plus 16 all over n. Now, unfortunately, though, if we tried to plug in infinity right now, we would still get an indeterminate form, right? You would still get infinity on the top and then infinity on the bottom. So we're going to use that little, uh, it's like a rule or a procedure where you divide everybody by this guy, right? Whatever the highest exponent is in the denominator. Yeah. So when I do that, this is just going to be 8n all by itself. Those ends will cancel. I'll just have 30. And here you'll get 16 over n. And what happens as n goes to infinity? This guy will go to zero. This will stay 30. But this will be infinity. Infinity plus 30 is still going to be infinity. I like something went wrong. Just don't know where. Oh, I see where it went wrong. <laughs> it's not going to change too much, but it is going to change a little bit, like going down here. So. Up here, when I squared this, I got this, right? And then I distributed my six over n. But did I really distribute the n? I did six times four i squared and got 24 i squared, right? But I, I do n times n squared. Yes, supposed to be n cubed. It doesn't change too, too much. It will change a little bit. So then that means this will be a three. So when it canceled one of those up there, it actually turned into a two then, right? When the one of them canceled with this guy. So then down here, it should be a two. So then it is gonna make it more complicated because my common denominator is not in this time, is it? It's in squared, right? So this would have to be n squared, n squared. And here, I need to multiply by an n over n. So again, this guy is going to turn to a square. All my denominators will be n squared. But this term's not right anymore, OK? Because I should have been distributing a 12n, right, to the n plus 1. So 12n times n is 12n squared. And 12n times 1 is 12n. It doesn't change it too, too much, but a little bit, right? Because now these guys have a square and this guy has an n. All of those are still all the same. So let me put a little n squared. And so then this is definitely going to change up some. I'm like, the area is not going to be infinity. I know that. <laughs> so let's see, 18 plus 8 is going to be 26 in squared, and then 24 in, and then plus 4 all over in squared. So this will be a little different now, right? Because now we're not dividing by n. What are we dividing by? Square. n squared. So it might look a little different. So n squared and squared will cancel. 24n over n squared will be 24. The one n will be stuck. And here, none of the n's are going to cancel. 
So you just have four over n squared. Now that makes sense. As n goes to infinity, this guy is going to go to zero and this guy is going to go to zero. And so we end up with just the constant 26. And I'm going to check it by doing it the other way that we all want to do, right? We all just want to integrate this thing and say that's going to be 3x cubed over 3 evaluated from 1 to 3. So 3 cubed is 27 minus 1 cubed is 1. Do I get the same answer, right? That's just not the way they let me do it. <laughs> the directions didn't say do that, right? Yeah. I had to do it this ugly long way. So for me personally, if I was writing a new sheet for this particular problem, this is all the algebra part. I would definitely have the summation formulas, okay? And then I would definitely write down this, just so that you know where all those little pieces are coming from, right? Definitely write down how you get all the parts. Good morning. Okay, then let's see. Let's sleep number four in here. Maybe we'll try. So this one does say to evaluate the definite integral, and it does not give me any crazy instructions like the last one. It just says do it, right? <laughs> There's nothing weird on this one. We don't have to do it the limit definition way, we just do it the regular way. But the first thing is we always have to turn houses to the power, right? So we'll have u minus four over u to the one half. And then you could even do each one over u to the one half, right? Separate the fraction into two individual fractions again. But when you do that, you're gonna have u over u to the one half. You always take the top exponent minus the bottom exponent. So an invisible one minus one half is going to give you a positive one half. But here you don't have any u's. So what would the exponent of u be? be like a zero, right? And then what's zero minus one half? That would be a negative one half. So you'll have four and then u to the negative one half. Once you have them in exponent form, there's just the power rule, right? So we're going to do add one. Which would give me three halves multiplied by the reciprocal of that minus four. Add one to this exponent. Well, negative half plus one is a positive half, and then multiply by the reciprocal. And no plus c because we do have bounds, right? So we get two thirds u to the three halves minus eight u to the half. I'm going to write this. This is the application of the fundamental theorem calculus, right? So you have to write this step. But then once you write it, you can just use your calculator. I'm putting in nine, and then I'm putting in one. So let's see two thirds parentheses. 9 raised to the 3 halves minus 8 times 9 raised to the 1 half. And here I get negative 6. And there I'm probably going to get just 2 thirds minus 8, right? And then overall, I end up with. Oops, yeah, same, sorry. I could have typed the whole thing in the calculator, but I didn't. I just typed this, wrote it down, typed that, wrote it down, and then subtracted it in the middle. And it fit barely, but it fit <laughs> on the page. Any questions about that one? All 
I will post all of our solutions. So this document was already in the canvas, right? With the problems. Um, once I post this recording, I will also post these paper solutions as well. Okay. Okay. Let's see number five. How many questions does the final test? The final has ten. All right. Ten questions. But we don't know which ones we're gonna have, so I just put enough to like kind of have an idea. Okay. <laughs> but no matter what you want to be bent, you're like, oh okay, I just manipulated this way or that way. Yeah. Because there's a lot of the definite rules from here on. It's just a lot, a lot of them. You're ninety nine percent sure number three is not on there, right? I'm pretty darn sure. Just I don't particularly like that problem, but it's I'm I think it's not on here. I think you have one like where it tells you to find the area. But it doesn't say you have to do it the limit. Okay. Plus, it's time consuming. And I don't I don't want that to be time consuming. I want you to be able to have enough time to do all the problems, have some time to look at it again before you have to actually turn it in. Um where am I? Number five. Number five is another indefinite integral. And there's a lot of indefinite integrals on this thing because um, I know that if you're using that flat calculator, you could type in the definite integrals and it'll just give you the answer. So that's why a lot of these problems are indefinite integrals. Not to say there's no indefinite ones on the test, there will be some, but most of them are indefinite. Okay, any ideas for this one? We want to get it out of the house. Okay. So what would the exponent become? Two thirds. Since I have all of this together, you're just going to have like a one. Because you can't do each term individually. So you have to do the whole thing. So one third. <laughs> Perfect. That would be the chain rule, right? Mm -hmm. Known as what in count two? Have different name in count two. It is, there is a chain rule going on in there. Remember? So in cow one, you're taking derivative, right? And when you do derivative, you have the chain rule, right? When you're doing calc two, you're right, you're doing integrals, so it's basically anti derivatives, right? And the way we undo the chain is we use the substitution. I was just thinking about that. So whatever has the power, right? Because you're going to want to apply the power rule. So whatever has the power is what you're going to let u equal. So we'll let u equal all of this mass. And then du would just be its derivative. So zero and then negative six x dx, right? And you have that, you have all of that. So it's just a matter of substituting your buddy in. So this integral will become uh, u to the one third, and then all of that stuff becomes du. And now it's pretty basic, right? So you can just apply your power rule. So if I add one, that's gonna be four thirds multiplied by the reciprocal. And then plus C. The only thing is, is we weren't given the problem in U, right? So we have the backs up. U is 5 minus 3x squared. And that's what we'll have the 4 thirds power plus C.
So here we did substitution. And then here we did back substitution. Right, you let you equal something, you play around with it with the use, and then we have to go back and put back what you was. Okay, any questions about that one? Now I'm doing a little bit more than I did in the past because I was trying to find a review for this class, the final review, could not find it. Um, I don't I don't have a document in here, otherwise I'd pull it up. But all I did was say, number one is gonna be this kind of problem. Number two is gonna be this kind of problem. Number three is gonna be find the area. Number four is gonna be find the volume. You know what I mean? Just that, that's it, that's all it was. And then I told students, go over your homework, pick some problems that match those directions and try them and I'll check your answers to see if you're right, but that's it. So it was a lot more self-guided the review before. But I curious that I have three of the same class this time. I felt like it was important to kind of cover it a little bit better. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, any ideas with number six? Yeah, I'll just put a minus x cubed as u. Yes. Okay. And then what would you have as d then? Yeah, three x squared. And then dx tags, right? Now, do you have all of that? All of the negative three x squared of dx. They only have this part, right? So let's get rid of that negative three so that we know exactly what to substitute for just the x squared and dx part. Okay. So then we know that the bottom is going to become u, right? And since I'm going to kind of pull this off to the side, what would go up here? You take the numerator away. Yes, one. And so instead of all of this right here, I'm going to put what it's equivalent to, which is du over negative three. Now, I know some of you do use sub just a little bit differently, like the way you actually work it out. It's okay. I understand them. So as long as you're doing it correctly, what if you do it, it looks a tiny bit different. I can still understand it. I am going to pull out this constant. So negative one third, and then I have du over u. Now, I don't know if you remember or if you have to go reference real quick, but does anybody know what the integral of du over u is? Ln. Yes. So ln of the absolute value of u. And there's no bounds, so I do have to put plus c. Is that my final answer? No, it backs up, right? So u was eight minus x cubed. And you cannot take the bars off on this one because we don't know if x were negative, if that stuff in the ln could be a negative number, right? So you have to be very, very careful. Or if x was a positive, actually, then you can eight minus that number and it could be negative. Um, so that's it for this one. Any questions on that one? So hopefully we can get through at least 14, but I'm pretty sure we'll get through more and just we'll start moving a little bit. Um, but again, we're not in any rush. We finished all the material. We're just kind of jogging back everything. So this one also says find the indefinite integral. This one is super, super tricky. Yeah. 
usually did do one like this, but this one requires a lot of memorization. Now I'm gonna go pull up some formulas. So let me go back. I think I know which one this is, but I want to confirm. It's like pretty the, sure it's like great. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's one of those trick ones. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, looks like it might be. Yep, because you got something squared minus. Oh, this is one though. We'll go down. Oh, the integration will tell. There we go. Yes, yes. So you have u, and then you have u squared, and then you have a squared. So it kind of looks like this. There's an issue though. I don't have u squared, do I? I have what? X to the fourth, right? But what I could do is I could let u equal something so that u squared is x to the fourth. What would u have to be? I mean, x squared. Yes, x squared. So when you square and square, it'll turn right to x to the fourth. Okay, but if u is x squared, then that means that du would be 2x dx. And I don't have that exactly. Okay, I don't have that exactly because um, this x is in the denominator, right? And this x is not in the denominator. But I'm going to try to do the use substitution. And what I'm hoping is, is that each of these x squareds cancel or I can substitute them again in. It's going to be interesting. So let's just see what happens. All I have is the dx. So I'm going to do this. And I can only do this if everything turns into u's at the end. But we have to make sure that everything's going to turn into u's. So I'm going to have one over, I don't have anything to sub for that. So I'm just going to leave it as an X for now. Since X to the fourth is U squared, I have U squared. What number would this be squared? Eight, Eight squared. And then the DX is going to become DU over two X. Now it doesn't look like it right now, but I'm going to mess with this a little bit and you'll see and it will turn all into use. So I'm going to take this one over two out to the front. I will have du on the top. And actually, x times x is going to be x squared, isn't it? But what is x squared? Would, would it be like 2x squared? It would, but I took that two out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, if it were still in there, it would be 2x squared. But what is x squared? So I can put all of these. It didn't look like it at the beginning, but algebraically it turned out okay. Now this does fit that definition. You just have one half of the front, right? So I'm going to write one half, and then I got to go look at the one again to set up my first. Um, u, u squared minus 8 squared. So I get 1 over 8. And then arc secant, the absolute value of u over 8. And then plus c. I tried to write it in there, but that switched. There's no bound, so we do have to have our plus c. So this would be one over 16, R secant. And then what is U? That's X squared, right? X squared. And so we don't need the bar, right? Because is an X squared always gonna be positive? So we don't have to have those bars there. This one was really weird. I was hoping that I would be able to turn these x's into u's. I really have to mess with it to see. So 
Okay, I think we have one more problem from chapter five. And then we'll start doing the volumes from chapter seven. So this problem, I'll show it to you over here, but I'm gonna end up redrawing it. It's twice because this number eight has two parts. So they give me the graph, which I'll recreate twice on my paper. Um, and they give me the functions and then they tell me to find the area, but in two different ways, okay? So one of them says to do integrating with respect to X and then the other one says do with respect to Y. Why do I put both of them in there? Because you don't know which one I'm gonna ask you for in the test, right? I'm not gonna ask you to do both parts. I'm only gonna ask you one, but which one, right? Let's be prepared and know how to do both. So let me recreate this for part A, and then I'll recreate it again for part B, because I'm going to mark it all up when I do part A. When I draw this, it has an intersection at 1 and 2, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So when you plug in negative 2, you get 4. Um, when you put in one, you get one. And so this one looks like I'm trying to draw, but I can never draw anything that's good the first time. But that one's a parabola, right? X squared. And then the other one is two, and then down one over one. Like that. And it's also going to get this guy as well. This was the region they were asking me about. So it said for part A, integrate with respect to X, with respect to X. What that means is I'm going to have vertical rectangles. So I like to draw a vertical rectangle. That's why I said I'm probably gonna write all over this one, but then I'll do another one in a minute. So if I'm doing vertical rectangles, then when I set up my integral, it has to be my bounds A to B, and then it has to be your top function minus your bottom function. Why? Because that's how you get the height, right? This rectangle, it's going to give you the top minus the bottom, and that gives you the height. The width is represented by that dx. Right? So for mine, my values are going from negative 2 to positive 1. Those are where my x sides. Now, the top function is the linear function, right? So the top function is two minus X. And then the bottom function is X squared. I like to write it like this with a bracket and a parentheses in case this guy has more than one term, you will have to distribute that minus, right? But it doesn't have more than one term, so it's just minus the X squared. It's not too, too terrible. 2 minus x minus x squared. And then we do our power rules. We get 2x minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3. And then we have to evaluate it at our bounds. So let's apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we get 2, 1 over 2, and then 1 over 3. So when I plug in negative 2, get negative 4. That'll be four divided by two, which is two. That'll be a negative and a negative, so positive eight over three. And then I uh, did not know this. So two minus one half. Two minus one half minus one third plus four plus two minus eight thirds. I get nine over two. 
So this is the area with respect to X. Now, it, we should get the same answer, right? Because it's the same region. So when I do part B, I should also end up with I over two, okay? But this part is gonna look different. I didn't scribble too much on that graph, so I think I can still use it without having to redraw it. But when you're doing it with respect to Y, that means you're gonna have horizontal rectangles. So it's not gonna go this way. They're gonna go this way. And unfortunately, there's gonna be a split. I am gonna have to draw it again, dang it. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, one. That was a good one. No. Almost. <laughs> okay. Whatever, it is what it is. <laughs> Let's get it up. Okay, even though I'm not touching the actual x axis, but we'll pretend it does. <laughs> um, so it's still this region, but what's happening is, is that when you're doing it with respect to horizontal rectangles, they don't use A and B, they use C and D. Okay, and then they don't use top and bottom anymore because your rectangle is not facing vertical. It's not sideways now, right? So you have to do the right function minus the left function. And then you can do dy, okay? So what happens here is I wish I had another color, but I finally ran out of all the ink and all my pins. Now I have no more of a single tint. So we're in the last week of the semester. I don't want to ask for another bet. But right here, the problem changes. Yeah. Oh no, it works. Okay. <laughs> I just scribbled it out for a little bit. See, notice right there where I drew my red line? The graph changes. We do some weird stuff with this thing. It just, I mean, it makes sense, but it's still very complicated. Okay, I can find the integral of this top part. I'm basically gonna have to split my integral into two pieces because I have one rectangle with this touching on the right side and this touching on the left side. But down here, you cannot draw a rectangle that goes all the way right here. It's what happens. You have one function take away the other function, right? Um, so it doesn't make sense to do it that way. What you can do though, is because of the symmetry of this x squared function, you can do one side, and then what do you do to get the other side? Right, they're symmetrical, right? So whatever this area is, you just double it and you'll get the whole area of that little pit down there at the bottom, okay? So it's gonna be two separate ones. Now let's talk about the one up here on top first. So the one on top, what's the lowest y value? For this piece right here. The lowest y value there. The lowest y value is one. And then the highest y value, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be four. Right? And if I do the right function, the right function is the line, so that's going to be 2 minus x. Oh, we can't put x. It's with respect to y, right? So we're going to have to manipulate our equations before I can put them in there. So y equals 2 minus x. So we have to solve for x minus 2. 
get negative x and then divide everybody by negative one. So I get negative y plus two is x. Or I could also write two minus one, same thing, right? So this would be two minus y. And then the left function is a little bit tricky. If I try to solve for x, don't you have to take the square root of both sides? When you do that, you get plus or minus, don't you? Which one of those pieces are we taking if we're looking at the right side? So we're only going to use the positive. So y equals x or x equals y, same thing. Oh, he did this backwards. Oh, I was thinking. This is x, the plus or minus goes over here. And you're right, we only take positive. So we're just gonna have square root of y all by itself. If I do zero, I get zero. If I do by one, I get nine. Okay, cool. So we have the square root of y and then y. But that's only the top half, right? I still have to do plus and then something for the bottom. Now here the y value goes from zero to one. And we're only doing this function. So the right which happens to be the square root of y minus the left, which is the, the y-axis, which is just zero. But what did we say we had to do to this to get both sides? So let's see what we end up with. We're going to be out wrong. So one to four, two minus y minus y to the one half, and then plus two, zero to one, y to the one half. And then we'll do our power rule. So we get two y minus y squared over two minus y to the three halves times two thirds evaluated from one to four plus two y to the three halves times two thirds zero to one. So let's see my plug in four I'm gonna get eight I plug in four, that'll be 16 divided by two, which is eight. I don't know about four to the three halves, so I'm just gonna leave that one alone. And then when I plug in one, I will get two. I plug in one, I'll get one and a half. And when I plug in one, I'm just gonna get two thirds. Same thing here, when I plug in one, I'm gonna get two thirds. And when I plug in zero, I'm just gonna get zero, right? I guess I didn't need those for the systems, okay. Let's see, the square root of four is two, two to the third power is eight. Eight times that, so that's negative 16, three. Now all of that, I don't know, two minus one and a half. Minus two thirds. So I'm minus five over six plus four over three. Plus four over three. Now this is not right. So I think we have a side error. I really don't want to double that thing. Oh, the building part's okay. Where is my
We're supposed to get the same nine halves, right? And I think, I think we chose the wrong radical. Square root of graph, square root. Yeah, I think we chose the wrong one. So if I were to have X, Y, this table. Oh, because I'm doing this left side up here. For the bottom, it makes sense, right? You're going from here to the positive side. So you would use the positive radical, right? But up here, I'm not using the positive side, am I? I'm using the negative side of this parabola. So it makes sense then, I didn't even think about it, but it does, that this should have been a negative radical and this one should have been a positive radical, okay? But if I make this one negative, what's gonna happen with a minus? Turn into a, into a positive. So that guy should have been positive, which means down here, I should have added it, right? Instead of subtracting it, which means down here, this guy and this guy should be added. Now let's see if that makes a difference. So that means these guys still scratch away, but I would end up with a positive 16 over three. Um, in here, that number might be different, although this number is still the same. But in here, it might be a little different because it's now plus two thirds instead of minus two thirds. So this one would have been 13 over six. So now let's see what we get. 16 over three minus 13 over six plus four over three. Ah, we do get the same. Very, very tricky one. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, I think one, if I do give you one with respect to why, I don't think I have an expert, just so you don't have to worry about the plus and minus. If it's X or X cubed, then you don't have to worry about the plus and minus. So it might be a little bit harder here than it is on the actual exam. <laughs> Just because we had to consider, you know, the right side of the parabola versus the left side of the parabola. And this thing doesn't explain anything. It just has the answer. I oh, like that does not help me. Okay, moving on. Number nine. So here, this is the question. It says you have y equals 16 minus x squared. There's a little graph there I already gave you. Um, it says find the volume of the solid form by revolving the region about the x axis. Okay. So we're going to write, let me rewrite this over here 16 minus x squared. And I'm going to recreate this graph. Again, one or when you plug in two, actually, four total. The number of the right this, and then all of this is shaking. And we are revolving about the x axis. So I'm going to draw a little arrow to tell myself I'm going around that guy. Now, the way you do it, you can choose this method or shell method or washer, disk and washer, the same method, just whether it's a hole or not, right? So I think for this one, we want to use disk. So there's a lot to, um, to remember here, okay? For disk slash washer, you have to remember that this one uses um, perpendicular. Rectangles to the line of revolution. Sometimes it's also called the axes of revolution. Okay. 
but your your they do have to be perpendicular. So since this is my line of revolution, that's a horizontal, right? So that tells me that my rectangle would have to be vertical. So I'm gonna write that down here. This is just like the process, the thought process. Okay. So my line of revolution is horizontal, which tells me that I should be using uh, vertical rectangles. And vertical rectangles tell us we're doing integration with respect to which variable? Yes. Yes, exactly. Now, here's the question. Am I using this or am I using washer? Think of it. This is like, I don't even want to say a salt lake because salt lake have holes in the middle, right? <laughs> but the disc is just one solid circle, thin, thin circle, right? Um, whereas the washer has a hole in the center, right? So when I start revolving this around the x-axis, is there going to be a hole in the middle of it? No, because my region completely touches that line of revolution, right? It's only if it had like a little bit of space somewhere that then I would have to use the, the washer method because that little space would create that hole, okay? So here it does touch this thing completely, which means I will be using the disk method. So I don't have any holes or anything like that I need to be taking off. So what is the formula for that? It is basically pi r squared. So pi, and then you do our bounds. What is my x bounds? This is dx. I'm looking for x values. Zero and four. Yes, zero and four. And then for my height, I have to do top minus bottom, right? So for that, it would be my function here, which is 16 minus x squared. And then the bottom is just y equals zero, right? So I really don't have to write it, but I'm just gonna write it. And it should always be um, by r squared, right? You only square them individually if there's a hole, okay? If there's no hole, then you just put the hole top minus bottom and then the square on the outside. Now, let's see. That's not too bad, I can foil that. So we're gonna have, oh gosh, 16, 256, 16 times 16. 58. So 256 and then negative 16 x squared twice. So that's going to be negative 32 x squared. And then when I square that guy, it's going to be positive x to the fourth. I'll try to squeeze it into you guys. So I'm going to have, just making sure we get the setup right. It's going to be 256 x minus 32 x cubed over 3 plus x to the big over five, and then your bounds zero to one. So when I plug in four, I'm gonna get 10, 24 minus, two, zero, four, eight over three, plus four to the fifth, uh, 10, 0, 2, 4, over 5. And when I plug in 0, it's just going to be a bunch of zeros, right? So let's see what we get here. 10, 24, minus 2, 0, 4, 8, over 3, plus 10, 24, over 5. And I get this really weird number, 8, 1, 9, 2, over 15. That is the answer. Sometimes I put a pi in the numerator and sometimes I put it on the side. It doesn't matter. 
So that one definitely took us back, right? I remember her dish, dish and washer method. Show method is different, right? Show method, show method is definitely different. It's different in two ways. One is you don't use parallel, perpendicular rectangles, you use parallel rectangles. Um, and two, for that one, you have to do top minus bottom and right minus left with the show method. Okay. For disc and washer, you only do right minus left if you're doing the horizontal rectangles. Okay. This one we didn't need to. The number 10 does specifically tell us we have to use show method, which is good because normally people will try to avoid it. So we have to make sure you know how to do it. So number 10 says this function, square root of x. It even has a little graph. Just one and one. And then it's kind of like sectioned off and shaded past the one. And it says we must use show method. And it does say it's revolving about the y-axis. So full di directions say, use the show method to find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region about the y-axis. So this time they're not revolving this way, they're revolving this way, right? But show method tells me that I have to use parallel rectangles. So since this is vertical, then parallel would also be vertical, right? So I am doing vertical rectangles again. That's nice. I always like doing them with DX. <laughs> it's a little bit less complicated than DY. So here, my shell method, we have to remember the formula. It's two pi, A to B, and then it's the height, and then it's the row, and then it's DX. Right. And so remember, one of them is top minus bottom, one of them is left or minus or right minus left. Okay. The row is just a little weird. Now, because we're doing vertical, okay, that means that your height has to be top minus bottom. Okay. So in this case, the top part is the square root of x, and the bottom would be the y-axis, which is just or the x axis, which is just zero. So for each of x, we're going to plug in the square root of x. Rho is a little bit different. Rho, if we already did top minus bottom, the only one left is right minus left. And you're not talking about the function, you're talking about the region versus the line of revolution. Okay. So is my region or is my line of revolution on the right? I'm sorry, region? Yeah, or line of revolution. Who's on the right? The region. The region, right? The shaded stuff is to the right of that little arrow, right? So then this means I'm gonna have to do the region minus the line of revolution. So for the region, you're just gonna use the variable X for the line of revolution, you use the actual value. But if this is the line of revolution, what is the equation? Isn't it x equals zero? So this would just be zero. So then for rho of x, we're just using x. x minus zero is just x. Now for our bounds, what are our x bounds? One, zero. Mm -hmm. So go left, right, zero, one. Each of x was this guy, row of x is this guy, and then we have to get So that's one half exponent times x. So remember that x is multiplied together, you add their exponents. So one half plus one is three halves. And then I can finally find my power. So I get x to be five halves times two fifths, 
evaluated from zero to one. Um, we end up with one times two fifths minus zero times two fifths. And so we end up with four pi over five. Yes, that's correct. Remember the formula for our B. This is the formula A to B square root of one plus Y prime squared. Yes, that's for our point. Now, the question for number 11 says find the arc length of the graph of the function over the indicated interval. And the function they give us is this function. And then the interval they give us is two to three. So we definitely have to do the computation to figure out what this is gonna be. And instead of writing down you know, what y prime is, and putting it in there and then doing all the algebra, I would have to rewrite this integral every single time I do something, right? So instead of doing that and having to rewrite the integral, I'm going to figure out what all of this is before I go try to put it into the integral. So let's first figure out what y prime is. Actually, I want to rewrite this a little different. So if I write this a little bit different, it might help me do the derivative better. So my coefficient is one over 10 and I have X to the fifth. Coefficient for the second term is one over six, but because X cubed goes downstairs, it becomes X to the negative three. And now when I do the derivative, I'll bring down the five and then decrease the power by one. Here, I will bring down the negative three and then decrease the power by one, which makes it negative four. And so I can simplify those guys. I end up with one half x to the four minus one half x to the negative four. Then I have to square it, right? Y prime squared. So what do I get when I square that? This guy squared is one to the fourth X to the eighth um, minus two. And when I multiply these together, I get one fourth. And when I add these exponents together, I get X to the zero. One fourth X to the negative eight. I don't even know why I have parentheses. There's no need for parentheses. I can clean it up just a little bit. That would just be minus one half. There's no x's. And then I still have to add one. So if I add one, what's going to happen to that negative one half? By combining this term and this term, it'll become positive one half. And then this is the one where you're going to want to factor it. It's going to go inside of a house, right? So to make the algebra of the integration part easy, you're going to want to know what that thing is factored. Because right now, if I try to plug it in there, my bounds are for my interval. The interval is going from two to three. So 
my bounds are going to be two to three. And I know exactly what to plug inside the house if all of this. But this is going to be a nightmare to try to integrate with that house on it. Okay. Um, so what we'll do instead is we'll just basically try to factor this. And this, I think when we were doing it in the class, I was telling you to use pattern recognition. So notice here when I had a minus sign and I squared it, I ended up with this, but the middle term was negative, right? Now I have the exact same thing, but the middle term is positive. And so the idea is, is that it should be this same thing squared, but instead of a negative, a positive. And you can double check. You can just write it in there and then go double check that it actually is the same thing. So if I were to square this term, I would get one fourth x to the eighth. If I were to square this term, I would get one fourth x to the negative eight. And if I were to multiply these two together, I'd get one fourth x to the zero, but I'd have to double it. So it'd be two fourths x to the zero. Isn't that the same as one half? So that little house is going to pop off. And I'm just integrating these two terms. So we get one half x to the fifth over five plus one half x to the negative three over negative three. And then we do have to evaluate it. I think I'll put it back downstairs. So let's see, when I plug in three, three to the fifth power, it's two, four, three over 10 minus one over three to the third times six, plus six two, two to the fifth, 32 over 10 minus 1 over 6 times 8, 48. So let's see, 2, 4, 3 over 10 minus 1 over 1, 6, 2 minus 32 over 10 plus 1 over 48. Oh, it doesn't want to give me a nice fraction. Fine. 2.3. I get this number 21.115, so on and so forth. But if you want to get the fraction, you might have to do it piece by piece. Nine eight three nine over four over five minus minus one over four eight seven six three over two forty it will not be the darn fraction. How can I make it give me a fraction? Four oh five. Is it four oh five? I think they'll accept this, but I had to have been a fraction. Five four oh five divided by five eight one two forty divided by five eight three. Three, so then I would have to multiply this one by 16 and that one by 27. Oh, God. Anyway, I'm not doing all that. 
<laughs> Maybe that's the answer. It's going to come out to some weird number like this 1, 3, 6, 8, 2, 3, over 6, 8, 6, 4, 8. So can take that Hmm. It'll take either or. And if it's a problem like this where I know the calculator is not going to give you the fraction, normally I just say round transfer to whatever because I know you're, <laughs> it's not going to come out. But if it does come out to a nice little number like two thirds, then I might say just type in a fraction. Okay. I think. We didn't get all the way through, probably a bit. I want to make sure we get to cover everything. So I'm going to go ahead and do the quote. I want to try to get to 40, but I don't know. Oh, we might. I think we could get to 14. Okay. So I'm not going to rewrite number 12. It's a whole thing. It says a force of seven pounds, a force of seven pounds compresses a 15 inch spring, a total of five inches. Um, distance would equal five inches. And then it says, how much work is done in compressing the spring eight inches? I had said before, it's him use Hooke's Law and write the answer in inch pounds, which makes sense because they gave me inches of pounds, right? So Hooke's Law is actually number one. Okay, so Hooke's law is this one, f of x equals kx. Um, and so the force that was given here was seven pounds, and the distance that they traveled was five inches, right? So when I solve for k, it's going to be seven over five equal to k. And then Hooke's Law tells us how to find the work. The work is essentially your bounds um, of your function. So from A to B, and then F of X, DX. So I now know what K is. So I know what F of X is going to look like. I know F of X is going to be 7 bits X. But what I don't know is the bounds. So it does not say find work right yeah it doesn't say compressing an additional eight inches because if it did say additional eight inches i would have to start from where it left off at five inches and then eight more would make it go all the way to 13 inches right if it had said the words compressing an additional eight inches but then it does not say the word additional you assume that it's from its natural state so if it's from its natural state, you have compressed it nothing, right? All the way until you get to compress it the eight inches, okay? So it's very much worth writing in your old sheet, right? If it doesn't say additional, you're gonna start at zero and whatever that number is. But if it says the word additional, start where it left off and then add those eight inches to that to get the top out, okay? But here though, it's not any, complicated computation, right? You have seven fifths times x squared over two, evaluated from zero to eight. So seven x squared over 10. So let's see, 64 times seven uh, divided by 10. I get four, 4.8. And when I plug in zero, I'm just gonna get zero. 
And since everything was already in inches and pounds, this is going to be in your inch pound units. I didn't have anything given to me in feet that I had to convert over or anything like that. But what would I do if the problem asked me for the answer in foot pounds, even though they gave you nothing but inches? I would have to convert it, right? So you would do four, 4.8 inch pounds times, what is it? One foot is 12 inches, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially you're doing 44.8 4 divided by 12, which is about 3.733 foot pounds, just in case, right? Okay, I think we can get through the next problem because the next problem is not um, next to they're not too too bad. They look like a lot, but they're not too bad. Now number 13 is also really easy in the words. I'm gonna scoot this up. So this one says. Find X such that the system is in equal. Excuse me, I don't know why I think of all of Um It says two children weighing 44 pounds and 66 pounds are going to play on a seesaw that is 15 feet long. And it has the image there and it try to convey, you know, the lighter person weight one is over here and the heavier person with weight two is over there. And so in order for them to find that equilibrium where this little pendulum needs to go, um, it would make sense that it's a little bit more toward one side or another, right? Because they're not the same size or the same weight people, right? Um, well, in order for me to have a state of equilibrium, then I have to have the same amount of uh, mass that's happening over here as there is happening over there, okay? So the way we usually find that center of mass is we would multiply the weights times the distance. So you have to basically take weight one times distance one and equal it to weight two times distance two. And then in somewhere in there, you'll be able to solve for X because that was what it wanted us to do, right? So the little guy's weight was 44 pounds and it's distance here, they represented it as L and L minus X, okay? Now, all I know though is how long the seesaw is, right? So I know how long the seesaw is. The whole seesaw is 15 inches. Or 15 feet, sorry. So I don't know, here's a little pendulum. I don't know what this length is here. So I'm just gonna use the variable X because I don't know what it is. But I know that on this side, it has to be the rest of the 15 feet, right? So weight two would be 66, and then it would be 15 feet minus however much space that one took up. And that's just a linear equation, right? We can solve that for X, it's not too bad. 66 times 15. Nine ninety, and then I'm going to add sixty six x. So forty four plus sixty six is one ten x. And then if I divide by one ten, pretty sure I get nine. But let me double check. Sometimes my brain does stuff that it shouldn't have taken. So if we get that the Pendulum would have to be moved over right nine feet. So basically this side is nine feet and then that side would be the remaining, which is six feet.
this problem is way better than the ones with all the intervals, right? <laughs> the centers of mass, lamnia, or something like that. I can't even say that word. But that was the center of mass problem that had all the intervals, right? But this one's not too, too bad. Okay, I think we're going to get through 14. It's really short, it's not too bad. And then 10 minutes. So here we have the indefinite integral again, B minus 20 to the eighth power, and then DC. So those are Cs, not twos. Do we have any ideas how to do this one? Okay. So, what would you let you equal? Uh, Z minus 20. Okay. So then Z would just be one, right? Maybe. Or just DZ. You don't even need to write that one, right? Uh, so, okay, good. That might work actually. So we have eight over, and then that in there becomes U to the power E. And then the DC just becomes DU. Yep, that'll do it. Just write that as a negative exponent, and then you can apply power rule. So if I add one, I'll get negative seven, and then divide by the new exponent, right? Plus C, because there's no bounds. So we just end up with negative eight over seven U to the seven plus C. Is it the final final answer? No. Right, the back set, right? So we get negative eight over C minus 20 to the seventh power plus C. Don't we have a seven anymore? Say it again. Don't we have a seven anymore? Oh, yes. Okay, I got it. Okay, I won't get into the next one. The next one is going to require us to do like five parts and all that good stuff. But you can look at it if you want to look at it ahead of time. We've covered half. Um, but when we come back, we're going to do five parts. This is probably going to be some kind of trig thing or another. This one's partial fractions. This one's using those half angles or double angles, the power reducing formulas, I think that's what they call them. Um, and then we start getting those, the stuff that we kind of a little bit more familiar with, right? It's not too long ago, all the series and the sequences. Okay, well, I will stop the video here.